uh, do we have any questions? And is my audio fine? Yes. Good. Thank you. Thank you for confirming. Question from. Okay, so what are your expectations for those with individual projects in order to get an A on the project? Uh, that's a very interesting question. So, whatever you promised in your project description, uh, if you finish that and and you have a, a well-written code, then you have a very good project report, okay? Uh, and the report should include uh, what you did, uh, briefly describe the, uh, the problem, uh, what solution uh, you have you have proposed, and the results you have shown. And of course, like the, the quality of results will not affect your grade. For example, let's say if you're doing classification, it doesn't matter whether you get 50% or 90%. Okay, so don't worry too much about the performance because that can vary a lot. There are a lot of factors which impact it. But of course, when you should not get like very bad performance, 0% or 5%, which means you were not able to train your network. So as long as you are showing reasonable performance, uh, you are good. And then you should also have some analysis. Okay, so that analysis should be about what you experienced uh, during your project. For example, if you were training and if the network was not training, then what parameters did you change? All right, and observations like how was your loss converging? How was your accuracy improving over time? Okay, so all those aspects, as long as you are describing those, discussing those in your report, uh, I think you will be good. So then let me see. Okay, another question. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I think I responded to most of these. During that time, I will not be available. I have like some prior engagement, a lot of PI meetings. So it will be very difficult to fit in that slot. Sorry about that. Otherwise, I do that uh, every year, but this year is not good. Okay, so that was the answer uh, to your, your question, Ryan. Uh, okay, John, do we need to include all the code or just the files that have to do with computer vision? No, just submit the whole code you have. And even if you are um, taking code from somewhere else, let's say from GitHub, so you should clearly state that, okay, this code is from this particular repository. This is not my code, but include that code, okay? Just the code, I mean, it should not include your pre-trained weights and all that. That will be too big. Okay, question from Fernando. Uh, would you say the report is more relevant to the grade than the project code? Not more relevant because the report is based on uh, what you have written in your code, right? And if if it's not, if the code is not there, then of course you can't write the report. So I will say like both are uh, correlated. And yes, I mean even if you have the code, if you don't have discussion on the report, that will I think uh, take out some of the marks. Okay. So the discussion and that analysis are the observations that's mandatory. Yeah, Victor, it will be good if you just convert them to PY. Because I think it's just one step for you, right? You just export it and you will get the Python files and just submit those. Question from Shane. Can we just submit our GitHub repo? Uh, yeah, instead I will, I will suggest like uh, just download it and zip and then submit. Because we need like whatever you're submitting as a, as a record as well, right? And GitHub might change, we don't know. The link is there tomorrow, but maybe day after that it won't be there. So don't submit links, submit the actual code so that we have uh, the exact copy for future reference. Okay, I think uh, those were all the questions. If there is any other question, uh, you can uh, let me know. Otherwise we can <clears throat> proceed to the lecture. Okay, so, we are talking about image segmentation and 
last lecture i think we talked about the basics what image segmentation is and a uh, few algorithms uh, which can be used to perform image segmentation uh, now we are uh, going like further so today i think we'll have two more uh, algorithms which can be used for uh, image segmentation but in this case you may realize that these are not like computer vision algorithms these algorithms are coming uh, coming from machine learning so completely from machine learning perspective which means that they are very general algorithms and used widely in a lot of lot of other problems but we will see like how nicely they fit into this uh, particular problem which is uh, image segmentation so these algorithms are actually used for clustering which is an unsupervised way of learning the first is k means and the second is a main shift okay so the we, we won't go into a lot of detail of like uh, these algorithms we will just uh, try to understand what these algorithms are and then how they are used in performing uh, in solving image segmentation task okay so image segmentation now we all know that you have a you have an image and you try to uh, create different segments and that those segments could be like representing different properties they could be just representing if all the pixels in the segment has similar color or they have same texture so you, you try to divide the image into certain parts so that's called image segmentation and the first algorithm which uh, we studied uh, studied was image binarization where what we did is we just converted the image into binary image where each pixel is either foreground or background okay so then the basic issue there was how to come up with a threshold how do we know that uh, whether this threshold is good for binarization or not and then we uh, discussed this Otsu algorithm which was pretty cool uh, which can automatically find that threshold for you all right and you will implement this uh, in your in your programming assignment 3 so if you have any doubt or uh, now is the right time uh, just just let me know but uh, we, we went through this and I think it was pretty straightforward so it will just give you this point which is the uh, kind of you can say optimal threshold which will divide your image into foreground and background then we uh, also talked about two other algorithms uh, which were looking into regions and one was region growing where you start which is kind of bottom up where you start from uh, one pixel and start growing that pixel into a region depending upon how similar that pixel and the pixels which you are adding to that segment are similar to the neighborhood so as long as they are uh, they are passing some similarity criteria you will keep growing that region and at the end you will get one big segment so on the contrary when the second was region splitting where you start from the full image and depending upon whether you have diversity in the pixel values you will divide that image into different sub regions as long as you are able to find diversity you will split that image region into four and for example you can look here uh, it's not diverse at all all the numbers are seven so you won't divide this region further okay so that's the stopping criteria okay now a question from grace what does image binarization of have okay image binarization have to do with regions okay so this is kind of uh, one extreme case of uh, regions right and in this case region we are saying one is background region and one is foreground region because the region is like a, it's, it's a concept, right? You can't refer to like maybe, it could be semantic sometimes, it could not be semantics. So in that sense, uh, image validation is dividing your image into two different regions. Okay, good. Okay, so now let's move on to clustering. First, try to understand what clustering is, and then we will briefly talk about these two algorithms and how they can be used. Okay, so clustering, it's a very general problem in machine learning and the idea is you have a lot of lot of data points and what you want to do is you want to divide those data points into different categories or you can say different clusters and that division is based on you should have a very high intra class similarity which means that if you have a cluster then all the data points in that cluster should be very similar to each other okay so that's a uh, one criteria which you want to meet the second criteria is the interclass similarity should be low, which means that let's say you have two different clusters, then if you randomly pick like two samples from those two clusters, 
they should not be very similar to each other. So these are the two criteria, and based on this, we divide all the data points in your in your data set into different clusters. And the end goal is to uh, uh, to to categorize like uh, each data point into one of the cluster uh, which you will finally get. So and mostly this is done in unsupervised fashion. You don't need any labels or anything. Okay, so this is pure unsupervised learning. Okay, so let's try to understand uh, from this real example uh, what clustering looks like. So in this case, let's say we have all these characters, all right? And what we want to do is we want to create groups. Let's say we just want to create two groups in this case. So creating two groups, it depends upon what kind of properties you are looking into. Okay, so for example, if I say that, okay, I want to create two groups, the first group should be Simpsons family, and the second group should be school employees. So in that case, this will be your two clusters. These will be two clusters, right? So the first cluster will contain like the all the family members from this list or these data points. And the second cluster will contain all the employees from the school. So again, this is the same data, but now we can change the, uh, the similarity criteria. What I can say is I can say that, okay, now again, I want two clusters. But in this case, I'm looking into a similarity uh, uh, pattern, which says that, okay, I want one cluster for, uh, for females and the other cluster for males. All right, so then the clustering will be different. Okay, so again, this is the same, uh, same set of data points. The, the objective is different. The similarity criteria is different. All right, so similarity criteria is, the, I think, one of the important things when you're actually performing clustering. And this is like another very interesting example. So if I have to uh, create clusters and let's say I got uh, these two samples. Now, depending upon what is my similarity criteria or, or what features I'm looking into, these two images might fall into one cluster or they might fall into two different clusters. Let's say, let's talk about the first criteria. So the first criteria is I want to create two clusters, one for humans and let's say other for dogs. So then clearly these two images should fall into two different clusters. But again, if I don't use that criteria, I say that, okay, just cluster the images based on the, the visual appearance. Or I can, I can say, okay, maybe based on colors or maybe uh, the, the texture. And in that case, it's very highly likely that these two images will fall into the same cluster. So now you can now you can see that uh, depending upon what uh, our similarity criteria is, you might get different results. Okay, so the clustering can be based on color. It could be based on intensity, location, texture. So we can have different set of properties. So this is like another very interesting example. Uh, so we we talked about the similarity criteria, right? So the the important question is how actually you compute that uh, similarity. And most of the time, I mean, we have seen so far, we just compute L1 or L2 distance, right? We'll continue doing that. But let's first try to understand like uh, <clears throat> how, how, it's, how to, it's going to change the, the outcome of the algorithm. So for example, if I have these two images, okay? So if I want to put like uh, apes into one category, then I should have a similarity function which is making use of some, some some type of features. I don't care what those features are. They could be color, texture, anything. So for these two images, it should give you a very small number, which means that it's kind of giving you the distance uh, between these two images. Okay, so it's, it's just like inverse of similarity. So that's the first case. Again, for the second case, let's say I'm just trying to cluster different words. Uh, so this is Peter, and again, this is Peter uh, in, in Polish. So if I have a, a, di a distance metric, it should give me a very small number because these two are close to each other, all right? Now, if you look at these two images here, both are fingerprints. If I have to come up with a similarity measure, which just says that, okay, differentiate images of fingerprints with images of faces, then these two should be pretty close and it should be very easy because the pattern looks pretty simple. Uh, or pretty similar to each other. But now the problem is different. The problem is this fingerprint is coming from person number one and this fingerprint is coming from person number two. So these are two different identities. 
Now I have to come up with the distance metric or a similarity function, which will take these two and use some kind of features. We don't know what, and it should give us a very high number because these are coming from two different subjects. And I want to cluster based on subjects. I want one cluster for one subject. All right. So it doesn't matter like what the visual appearance is. The most important part is what are the features or what is the objective which we are interested in. And that will define what your similarity metric will be or the distance metric will be. All right. Okay. Now, so that's the uh, overview of uh, uh, how clustering works. Now, let's talk about k means. So, k means is again a clustering algorithm, very popular, uh, very simple algorithm. It's, it's very widely used and it's a very, uh, it has like a two or three steps. Uh, so, let's uh, go through them. So, what we do is we, we start with some initial cluster centers which are random, randomly picked, right? So, let's say you have a lot of data points with you and you want to cluster them. So, you start with some initial uh, cluster centers. And then what you do is you go to each of the data point and depending upon how close this data point is with like each of these initialized centers, you just assign that data point to one of the clusters, so which, 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 whichever of these is like the closest, all right? And you can do that for all the data points in your data set. So essentially what will happen is all the data set, all the data points in your data set will be assigned to one of the clusters, which you assigned actually uh, which you uh, initialized randomly all right so that's the first step and then what will happen is once you have that assignment then each cluster will have some uh, set of data points then you can use those data points and then recalculate the center and that will be just average of those points and those recalculated center points are your new cluster centers and that those are the only two steps you need and then you just keep repeating your process so that's k means and it might be difficult, but let's uh, go through a very simple example. I think it will be uh, more clear. So let's say these are uh, the data points which I was talking about. All right. And these are roughly eight or 10 points. Now, the first step was we randomly initialize some cluster centers. So let's say uh, we assume that we have three different clusters. The first one is blue. The second is red. And the third is, let's say, this is purple, I think, purple. All right. So I randomly initialize these points. That's the first step. The second step is for each data point, I will compute the distance from these cluster centers. All right. So for example, if I talk about this point, then I can clearly see that, okay, this is closest to the blue one. So I will just make this blue. Similarly, this one is like closest to uh, the blue one, right? This will be blue. Uh, but if I look at this data point, it's very close to the red one. So it will be red. So based on that uh, distance metric, I will just convert all the data points and assign them to one of the cluster center. So you can see that all these points over here, they were closest to the blue one. So all of them are blue. These two were closest to red one. They all are red. And all these were closest to purple. Now they are purple. All right. So that was the second step. Now the third step was you just recalculate the cluster center. And that's pretty straightforward because now if you look at the blue cluster center, you just forget about your original cluster center. You don't need it anymore. You just needed it to compute, it, compute the distance from all the points. Now that is done. Now what you will do is we'll just take all these blue points and take their mean. Okay, so the mean is over here. And that's your updated cluster center. You can see that the origin was over here and it moved to this location. And same is true for uh, the red one. The initial cluster center was over here, but you recalculate the center, it's over here. And so it, it's just at the center of these two points because it's just a mean, right? And same is true for the purple one. Now you just keep repeating those three, those three steps. Again, you will compute the distance and assign uh, one of the cluster center. So in this case, you can see that this point over here, which was blue earlier, now it seems closer to the red one, all right? So what will happen is it will turn red. And again, you will keep repeating and your cluster center will change. It was here, then it will move to new location. Similarly, this one actually shifted, right? Because this one turned to red. And you keep repeating those three steps and that's your uh, k-means algorithm. 
Okay, uh, question from Mohamed. How do we decide if a point is close enough to a cluster center? Do we need a proximity threshold? A point is close enough. Uh, you don't need to determine whether a point is close enough. You just need to find out what's the closest cluster center. So in this case, you have three cluster centers, right? A red, blue, and a purple one. So for each point, you will get uh, three distances, right? So distance from blue one, distance from red one, distance from purple one. So which, whichever of these three is minimal, you will just pick that. So you don't need any, any threshold. All right, good. The question from what? Could you please repeat the part we choose the initial colors? What was the criteria? Okay, let me let me go back. Okay, initial colors. So initially, these are the data points. We don't have any colors, right? We don't know which cluster center they belong to. This was the first step where we just initialize centers randomly. So these are just random points. And I just mark like random colors as well. I mean, I could have marked this one, maybe black or maybe something else, maybe green or yellow, right? So colors doesn't matter at all. So this is cluster center number one, two, and three. Again, randomly initialized. Now the second point is you compute distance of each and every point in your data with these cluster centers. And whichever cluster center is the closest, you assign that cluster center uh, to this data point. So like this. Okay, so question from only thing we choose is the number of different colors. Yeah, that's true. You The only parameter you need is how many cluster centers do you want? And that's a very good question because that's a very important parameter in your algorithm. And that's one of the limitation of k-means. We will we'll talk about that. All right, okay, good. So you keep uh, repeating that and you can see that your cluster centers are changing and colors of the data points are changing and uh, you keep doing that until there is no change. And if there is no change, you are done. And then uh, at the end, you get three clusters. One is this one, the second is this one and the third is this one, all right? And that's the end of K-means algorithm. Okay, so that was pretty simple. Now let's talk about what are the uh, pros and cons of this algorithm, what, what are the challenges? Okay, so, <clears throat> so this is good. We How do we assign the cluster center? So right now I'm just showing you uh, points in Euclidean space, right? But uh, essentially what you will have is, you will have your feature vectors when you are working maybe some uh, on some problem. So it will be uh, n-dimensional space. And it, mo most of the times the distance measure will be L1 distance or L2 distance. Okay, so that's good. This is also fine. I think we just discussed that. For each point, you will uh, compute the distance from each of the uh, cluster centers. Whichever is the closest, you just pick that. I think there is another question. Uh, what could be the data we use to make the center calculations? Excel intensity or physical coordinates? Center calculations. Yeah, that's a very good question, Mert. Uh, but I'm a bit confused. So you are saying that uh, the features we are going to use, or because there are two two things here. The first is okay. So the average means here the average of x and y coordinates. Right. That's true. So in this case, it's Euclidean space. So for each data point, you will, ha you will have X and Y, and those X and Y are your features. And if you have an n-dimensional uh, feature vector, which let's say have thousand different values. So in that uh, high dimensional space, you will have some point. And again, you can compute the distance, right? L2 distance between two points. So for an, for an image, how could that space be represented like? Right, the, so for the intensity yeah. of every single pixel, those are the quote unquote coordinates, right? Mm -hmm. Right, right. I, I get your point. So, again, there are two things here. Uh, the first is I think uh, the way you are going, I think you are talking about image segmentation. So, we are going to talk about that just, just wait for a while. There, I think uh, the location is also important. All right, 
but if you take if you if you consider like a, a general problem then usually what you do is you convert your pixel values to some features right you, you take your image and extract some set of features so you don't care about the actual location so if you have to do clustering of images then you don't care about those locations but if you have to perform segmentation which we're going to cover in a while then uh, i agree that xy location is important you will take that into account so i might have missed the point in the in the past how would that be in the in the case of extracted features you okay, said so you don't care. all right all right so let let me uh, talk about that so if so extracted features it means that you have a set of you have set of images and you want to cluster those images based on let's say object categories so then again what you can do is you can use any algorithm for feature extraction it could be your hog or it could be maybe your pre-trained cnn right so earlier what you used to do is let's say you were uh, solving classification so then you extract features and then you use svm to classify right so follow the same steps extract features but instead of training a classifier you perform clustering so use the same set of features because they represent that image thank you okay okay so the second aspect uh, we are uh, going to cover that uh, pretty soon okay so this was good now uh, a good uh, interesting question i think someone asked earlier like uh, what is a good uh, distance measure and as i said like uh, l1 l2 distance uh, are usually fine if, if you're working in a feature space okay so you can just compute the euclidean distance okay so this is good we just recalculate the cluster centers and again so this is just taking the mean so it will be mean of like x and y dimension independently if it's a two-dimensional Euclidean space. Okay, so the this algorithm, what it's trying to do is, uh, as as we discussed earlier, it's trying to minim, uh, actually uh, cover two aspects. The first was to maximize the inter the intercluster distance or similarity, and it's trying to minimize the intracluster similarity. All right. Okay, so now, now let's talk about the limitations and some of the parameters uh, which, which are required. First of all, for k-means, we should always know beforehand how many clusters we will have. If we don't know that, we, we can't run this algorithm. All right? So that's a very important parameter uh, for, for k-means. Okay, so the second issue is convergence. When should we stop? So again, there are a lot of variations there. One is we can just stop like after a certain number of iterations, we can fix that. Or we can have another criteria where we, where we say that, okay, if the partitions are actually not changing, or we can say the cluster centers are actually not moving. So that is uh, another criteria. Now let's, uh, let's try to uh, think about how the initialization might affect your final outcome, all right? So let's say earlier we saw one uh, example where uh, we had like three initialized uh, centers which were initialized randomly. And the final outcome was actually pretty nice. Those three clusters were uh, separating quite well. Now, again, we have the same set of data points. And uh, again, so this time uh, as we are initializing these centers randomly, so this might also happen, all right? So the first center might uh, be at this location, second at this and third at this. Now, how much uh, iteration you perform your final outcome is never be, uh, going to be perfect because these centers will never move out of this cluster because all the other points are far away from this location, right? So at the end, what's going to happen is all these points are going to be uh, of uh, this cluster and means some of these are going to be one cluster and some one of them is going to be on the other cluster. So in this case, uh, this is not a good convergence, and this happens a lot because the weights are or the centers are initialized randomly. So the initialization is actually uh, very important. So now let's uh, see if we can do something about this. Uh, question from Anshuman: How do we handle spatial complexity if we try to use k-means for segmentations? Yeah, Anshuman will will come to that. Right now, we are not talking about segmentation, so we're just trying to understand different uh, properties of k-means. 
So in a while, we'll talk about segmentation, then we will cover like how we can handle this spatial proximity. J just hold on. Okay, so then the question is how we can uh, initialize like uh, these uh, cluster centers. Okay, so the first, uh, the variation which we saw is we just initialize them uh, randomly, all right? The second variation is what we can do is instead of initializing them randomly, we randomly pick some examples from, from the data set itself. Okay, for example, we could just pick this one and then we pick this one and then we pick another one. So then whatever centers we have, they are actually data points in our data set, not just random points. Okay, so then the third interesting thing to do is, what we can do is we can initialize with one center. Okay, we picked one. Then while picking the second center, we ensure that it's not very close to the first one. Okay, and again, it's it's based on heuristics, but sometimes it helps. It helps. Okay. The fourth one, I, I think this is the most uh, important one, and it's used uh, most of the times. We use this variation, and what we do is we just try multiple runs. Okay, we will initialize once. We will initialize again. We will try multiple runs, and then just take the average, and this uh, works out pretty well. Uh, the fifth one again if you want to be more sophisticated what you can do is you can try another clustering algorithm okay and this is actually it in, in reality it works pretty well so there are a lot of clustering algorithms which are not as good as k-means but you can actually use those to initialize your cluster centers for k-means and they can be like very good initialization points and then you can start your k-means after that okay for some of the problems it also uh, works pretty well now we are moving on to image segmentation. I think a couple of you had questions. And I just have one slide for this because you already know what k-means is and how uh, that algorithm works. So we don't need to discuss that a lot, all right? So what we do is we initialize cluster centers on pixel grid in steps of S, which means that you take your image and you know how to create grids, right? You just uh, create multiple grids in that image. And on each grid, you will just randomly pick one cluster center, all right? And in this case, the feature, so this is like uh, answer to your question, uh, Anshuman. And I think also Mert or someone else asked. Uh, so what features we use? We use uh, color features. And so not RGB features, but a uh, lab color space, but you can use RGB as well. The lab gives you better result. That's just like uh, based on experimentation, but you can use RGB as well or HSV as well. It doesn't matter. Okay, so you're using color. And apart from that, you also use the XY position of the pixel. So XY position of the pixel could be, you can start, you can treat like this left top uh, corner as the origin and just use this as a coordinate system. Then each pixel will have a XY position. Just include that in your features. So it will be a five dimensional feature space which you will use to compute the distance. All right, and again, it will be a Euclidean distance. The second step, so this step is clear to all because I think this, uh, this is pretty straightforward. This, uh, this is just saying that, okay, what features to use and how to initialize your clusters. The second step, uh, step is again, it's optional. You don't have to do it, but uh, what it, it says is you, whatever uh, centers you have initialized, you take a small window three cross three window in that image. And you move that center to the position where you have the smallest gradient, okay? So what this means is for each pixel, you can compute gradient. You know how to do that. You have learned edge detection, everything, right? So for each pixel, you will have a gradient. Now in that three cross three window, the direction or the pixel location towards which you have the smallest gradient, you just pick that one, all right? So the idea is when you don't have very high gradient, which means that you won't have edges, right? You will have very smooth surface. So picking point in a smooth surface is actually beneficial because that could be like part of some segment. But if you are on an edge where you will have very high gradient, then it's very highly unlikely that uh, it will be maybe center of the region, right? It could be at the border. So that's not a good initialization point. So just to ensure that you just move towards the uh, the flat region, and that can be done using following the smallest gradient direction. Okay, and again, this is a very minor step of pre-processing. You can say 
you can even avoid this if, if you don't do this the results won't change uh, change a lot all right now the third step is the second step of your key means where what you do is you compute the distance of each pixel to the cluster center and in this case what you do is you actually don't compute uh, the distance to all the cluster centers you only compute distance with the cluster centers which are in a neighborhood because you don't want to perform like extra computations right because it, it's highly unlikely that uh, a pixel on this left top corner will belong to a cluster where the center is on this right bottom right bottom that doesn't make any sense you can't have that bigger segment so you only look into a small neighborhood and that neighborhood is just defined by this parameter s and you take a neighborhood of 2s all right so this is again a cluster assignment the second step once that is done then you just recompute the cluster center like you did for k means and you just keep doing that all right and you can have some uh, stopping criteria in this case you put some threshold and if your overall error is actually less than that you stop otherwise you keep doing it so again this is a very standard k means algorithm all right so yeah this is uh, this is pretty fast and it, it's used very widely actually it was proposed in 2012 and uh, it is a very uh, widely used uh, clustering algorithm so and i think we have a faster implementation these days uh, because we have imp implementation of slick on gpus as well so it can be much faster than this 0.36 uh, seconds all right so these are some uh, plus points you will get a regular so these uh, segments are called super pixels because they belong like a, a big segment and again it's based on the spatial proximity and the color and they perfectly fit boundaries most of the time you can see that uh, in this case like you have these nice boundaries right so it will never miss the, those boundaries and uh, the example here you can see that uh, on the top uh, in this uh, in this bottom right the s was pretty big so you have bigger super pixels as you keep reducing that uh, the value of s you will get very fine super pixels all right and you can even have finer super pixels if you reduce it further but still like these super pixels are, are, are also very useful okay so these are two limitations which i think is fine so they might miss like 10 objects because what it's doing is it's trying to cluster it's trying to cluster pixels based on spatial proximity right so that will enforce that it's whatever a uh, segment you get it's kind of spherical right because uh, you're using a euclidean distance uh, or a l2 distance measure and so if you have a very thin object which is kind of a line then it will be missed the other drawback is you will get large number of super pixels depending upon like what value you are for s but which is fine depending upon like you might need more super pixels uh, for some of the cases okay so a question from Amomal: what is s s is just a parameter which defines like the neighborhood area so it could be uh, it could be let's say 20 by 20 pixels so then s will be 20 which means that when you're computing the distance you look into s further as just 20 pixels you won't compute the distance with 21st pixel and which also ensures that your super pixel will never be bigger than 20 cross 20 or some somewhat around that range thank you professor and uh, i'm also confused about how we initialize the cluster centers you said with grid how are we doing that okay so all right just give me a minute Can you see my sketchboard? Yes, Professor. Okay, good. So this is your image. And what you do is you create these grids. Right? And then uh, in each cell, you randomly 
pick like one pixel. So this is your cluster center number one. Then again, you randomly pick another one. And you keep doing. Is it clear? Yes, Professor. OK, good. So now let's move back to slides. Yeah, so and that's it. So And then we take our S cross S um, window. And then we slide it over this uh, image with these uh, centroids. And then we assign um, those pixels to each cluster, right? Right, you don't slide over. And that's the beauty of this algorithm because you, you can actually compute uh, distances in parallel. Right, yeah. Within a region of 2S, right? You don't have to wait for the other part of the image because you know that they are independent of each other. You're not, not never going to cross that 2S boundary. Yeah. So it's kind of, uh, it's, it's kind of running that k-means locally within a 2S range. Yes, thank you, Professor. Okay, great. Okay, so that was k-means and let's move on to mean shift. And I think it's, uh, it's, it's a bit complicated uh, if you go to the implementation. So as I said, we are not going to uh, talk about the implementation, but the high level idea, because I want you to understand the intuition of why we use mean shift uh, for clustering or for MS segmentation. Okay, so at a high level, uh, one advantage of using mean shift is we don't have to say that, okay, how many clusters uh, we want. And in k-means, you will get these kind of super pixels, which are kind of maybe a voxel shape, right? But k means, uh, sorry, uh, mean shift k provides you something else. It actually provides you these segments, which can be of irregular shape. They will not be like pure voxels or round shaped uh, all the time. So these are some of the outcomes of uh, mean shift. And uh, the you, you don't have to say how many such segments will be there, will be there in the image. Okay, so that's a good thing about uh, mean shift. Okay, question from Mark. What is the super pixel? Okay, good. Yeah, super pixel is uh, that, that segment you're getting uh, out of the, uh, the slick algorithm. Okay. So, yeah, I think I never mentioned that. So this algorithm is called slick. It, it's based on k-means. And I think this is a uh, acronym for linear clustering. Simple linear iterative clustering, I think. Yeah, something like that because it's pretty simple. But yeah, this uh, this image segmentation is called slick. And by the way, this student, like the the first author, he he was also the student of my first advisor, my PhD advisor. So which which is pretty cool. Like he did this great work. Yeah, so great simple linear iterative clustering. Yeah, that's right. Thank you, thank you for sharing that, Grace. Okay, so let's move on to uh, mean shift. So what mean shift does is uh, you have, so consider consider one uh, image, right? And if, if you just look into, into the pixel color values, then what will happen is if you consider like one color as a, as a segment, for example, uh, this ocean, right? So this is kind of a distribution. It's a distribution of points. And what mean shift does is it tries to find the center of this distribution. Right. For example, if you look at this a tree over here and all the pixels which are part of this tree, they will have certain color with some variation. And if you look this uh, from probability point of view, these are just points which are defining one particular distribution. And mean shift tries to find the center of this distribution. Right. So that's the high level idea. I will show you a one very concrete example what that means. Okay, so what it does is it, it tries to find those uh, centers of distributions and that's the reason it doesn't require like uh, uh, a number for how many clusters you will have. Because uh, depending upon your image, your, your number, of, uh, number of distributions or different distributions you will have, it will vary and it will autom automatically try to find that. So let's uh, let's uh, look at this example so uh, th those centers uh, which i'm saying that the center of the distribution we also uh, call uh, call them modes or local maxima okay so for example if you consider this uh, consider this image and in this case we are just 
uh, doing a scatter plot of the colors. So this is L U V uh, color space. This is similar to like uh, RGB color space, or you can say that uh, maybe the earlier of which we what we use for slick algorithm. So you can use any color space. In this case, it's L U V. So don't worry about that. And so the, these are just uh, points in 3D environment, or you can say a uh, 3D space. And each point is representing one pixel in this image. The location actually defines what is the exact value of L, U, and B, or you can say that what is the exact value of color. All right, so this is just a scatter plot. Now you can see here that you have distant, different distributions, or you can say different modes. So this is like one mode. You are uh, seeing one cloud over here. And you can see like this is another cloud, maybe another mode. This could be another mode. And this is like one big mode. So uh, this a mean shift tries to find these uh, modes, and these modes will be your segments. Okay. So again, it's it's kind of clustering because at then what will happen is, once you have found this mode, then you will know that okay, which of these pixels actually belong to this mode. Similarly for this one, you will just cluster like which pixels belong to this mode. Okay. So that's why it's clustering. And uh, the idea is what you do is you keep tracking a certain area in the image. And in that particular area, what you do is you try to find out the distribution of the pixels. Okay, so in this case, let's say we're trying to find this particular mode, which is a maybe a black circle, but we placed our window at this location. So it's not entirely at the center of this mode because most of the pixels are lying outside. So then what mean shift will try to do is we'll try to shift this window towards this mode. So it will move toward the left, move toward the left. And this is kind of a perfect fit. And then all these pixels in this area will be like corresponding to this particular cluster. You can say this mode. So that's how uh, mean shift works. So let me quickly go through like, I think a, a demo, which will make it more clear. Yeah, this is just fine. You, you just compute like the, the center of uh, that area. Okay, so I think this is more interesting and more easy to understand. So these are uh, all your uh, pixels or all your data points with uh, different different colors. And let's say the location, the XY location actually represent the color, all right? Now what we do is we start with one random location, all right? And we'll have some search window. So this is one parameter. Uh, I think the only parameter you have in mean shift. And this parameter will define how many segments you will get, how, uh, what will be the, like the size of the segments, whether they will be big, whether they will be small. If you have a smaller window, you will get smaller segments. If you use bigger window, you will get bigger segments. Okay, so this is a search window. What you do is you take the center, you look at the search window, then all the points or all the pixels which are inside the circle, you just compute the mean. Okay, and mean. That's the equation. Okay, so you compute the mean, and then again, similar to your k means algorithm, this is the updated mean. Okay, so what's happening the way you're computing the mean, this is ensuring that you move towards the dense regions. And you can also say that that's the center of your mode or center of your distribution. Okay, so you compute the center. That's the next one. Then you just shift your center. Okay. And that's why it's called mean shift because you have to compute this mean shift vector and you move in this direction. And that's just one step of mean shift. You will keep doing that. All right. You again compute the center. Again, move it. Okay, you keep doing that until the center is not changing. And ultimately what will happen is the densest or the dense, the most dense region in your distribution or in your uh, pixel locations, that will be the center of that mode. And that will be your one segment. And then you're done. Okay, in a way, this is like similar to how uh, k-means work. But there we we don't actually have this uh, search window. There we compute it for it for all the all the pixels. 
Okay, so in practice, what we do is we initialize like a lot of lot of points like this. And I think there is a question mean shift is sensitive to outliers. No, it's not sensitive to outliers. Actually, it's in fact uh, very robust to outliers. Why, why, why do you say sensitive a moment? Uh, because professor, uh, a point which is like alone but have a very large value can make a bad update to the mean of the points that you're considering and the mean could be shifted in a wrong direction, not towards the dense part of the data set. No, if it's if it's just one point, how can it have a large value? I mean, it's just a point. So if you carefully look at the, that equation, so there every point counts. It's based on density, not the actual values of the pixels. But if a point have a very large value, it is going to affect the mean more. Right. No? So what do you mean by a large value? All a high all... pixel intensity, maybe. Okay. So if uh, the points that we are considering are in the range of zero to 50, but one point in that in one point um, in that uh, data set that we are considering is like thousand or 5,000, it's going to impact the mean more and the mean will be shifted towards that point more. But in, in real image, you won't have such outliers, right? In your values. No, how much I mean even if it's noise it will be between 0 and 255 right okay mm -hmm. that makes sense yeah that's right okay so uh, so what we do is we have like a lot of lot of these points and uh, the all the steps which we, which we just discussed we keep moving the centers we repeat those for all these points and at the end what will happen is if path of two of the uh, locations is actually merging. We just assign a single cluster center to both the points, okay? And that's exactly what allows like you to have bigger regions. And again, you can run like all of this in, uh, in parallel because each point is, uh, each point is like separate. You, you don't have to wait uh, for other points to like, Make an update, and it that's similar to like what you did for our k-means. Okay, so yeah, these are fine. These are the steps which we just uh, discussed. Okay, so yeah, the important point was like if uh, two of the points are actually merging to the same cluster center, all those points uh, will will belong to the same cluster center. Something like this, right? So, for example, if uh, you started like from all these locations and all of them are merging at this location, then all of these points will belong to the same cluster. Okay, so this is good. This is like one sample trajectory. Okay, so again, this uh, for, for computing the uh, similarity or like the, the distance, you need some features. You need to use colors, you can use gradients, texture. Okay. And this is fine. You initialize uh, different uh, feature points. And for each point, you perform this mean shift. And you will merge those points, which uh, end up at the same peak, the same mode. So that's pretty simple algorithm for mean shift. Okay, so this is uh, one example we have. And this is like a result for one of uh, one of the setting for that uh, window we used. So it looks pretty nice. You can see that like the benches are one segment. Again, the trees are one segment here. So in reality, how this will look like, so this is another very interesting uh, image. It's very bright colors. This is the uh, pixel distribution. Again, this is a raw RGB. So showing all the uh, pixel values. And this is the outcome of uh, the algorithm. Okay. And this is the outcome of the mean shift. So you, you get like all these, all these clusters tightly, like tightly grouped together. Okay, so that's fine. <clears throat> yeah, I have this nice demo. Uh, 
I think there's a question from me. Yeah. So we perform a window search for each data point. Yeah, that's true. So we'll have multiple data points as a starting uh, as a starting criteria, and we perform for all, all of those points, the same set of steps. Okay. Okay, so this is like a real world image, and that's why like it's very robust. I mean, it, it works for even for a real world image. It doesn't have to be nice and clean images. This is showing again the RGB distribution or the scattered plot for this particular image. And that's how like I try to visualize how the points will converge. It looks something like this. So eventually all the pixels will actually end up in at the at the center of the mode. Okay, you can see like some of the pixels are taking a, a long time, but eventually going to one point. And again, as I said, like how many points you will get, that will, that depends upon like what's the size of your search window. If you use a very big search window, you will get very few clusters. If you use a very small search window, you will get a lot of a uh, lot of uh, segments. Yeah, I I agree with you, Victor. Okay, so that's the segmented result and now the price tag is gone. All right, so that's all I think I have for today. Uh, we are well within time. And so the, the pros of mean shift are you don't have to assume that your clusters will be spherical, which was the case with uh, k-means. And we only have one sig single parameter, right? Uh, the, the search window, we don't need anything else. And it will it will try to find like all the modes which are present in that image. It's it's very robust to like outliers because it's trying to find the density. It's not relying on the actual values. So if the if you have dense set of points, it will just move towards that direction. Because if there is an outlier, it will not be in a dense region, right? It will be somewhere else. So you will never uh, your 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 points will never fall uh, go go into that that direction. So the, the negative points are, the output will depend upon the window size, but of course it's just one parameter, so you can, you can cope with that. And this is the major drawback, the second one, it's computationally expensive. Because if you think about this, you are initializing a lot of, lot of centers, and for each center, you are actually performing those steps. And uh, that's going to be expensive. And the other limitation is it, it doesn't scale well with if you have a very uh, high dimensional space. For images, it's fine. You just you can just use RGB, so it's three dimensional. It works pretty fast. But if you increase the number of dimensions and try to cluster images, which could be maybe thousand dimensional long or maybe five one two, then it will struggle a lot. So that's all I have for today. Any questions? Uh, I will be happy to answer. And any other questions regarding project regarding the course you have? Please, please let me know. Okay, question from Fernando for mean shift. Would the search window be a square shape instead, basically just looking x pixels apart from the center? Search window will not be square, right? It will be a circle because, but if you want, you can make it square. But that won't change things a lot. Okay. Uh, question from Daniel. Yeah, that's a pretty good question. So, what's on agenda for the last two lectures? So, this uh, semester, I think we had a lot of holidays on Tuesdays and Thursdays. So, we will not be able to cover all the 20 lectures I have. And most probably, camera modeling, definitely not. That's a very complicated topic. So, we are not going to uh, go over that. So next lecture, we will talk about semantic segmentation. And I hope we will finish it, finish it in time. And then uh, uh, the next two, next lecture will be on instance uh, segmentation. And those two will be the only topic we are uh, planning to cover the uh, rest of this course. So, okay? so no optical flow, I guess. Yeah, no, right. no optical yeah. flow, no action recognition. Okay. But yeah, I mean, if, if you have any questions or you want to know more, please, please visit office hours or let me know. I can schedule a separate meeting. We can discuss optical flow action recognition. That okay. will be perfectly uh, fine. Would you, could you post the uh, lecture slides so that we can at least, you know, have access to them and uh, refer whenever? Uh, lecture slides for today or? No, 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 no. Like, uh, 
like things like optical flow action. Oh yeah, sure, sure. Stuff, I, will, yeah. I, I will, I will, do that. Okay, so question from train. When will the interim report responses be uh, posted? So interim report. Uh, for most of you, I think you are on track, so we won't uh, respond. So you are good to go. But for some students uh, who are lagging behind, uh, we will. Uh, contact you separately, okay? If you see there is some issue, we will contact you. Otherwise, I think you are good to go. So that's good. Now, question from George. Can you still upload the slides for the lectures? Yeah, yeah sure, George, I, I will do that. Question from, if you already scored 2020. Yeah, if you have already scored 20 out of 20 in programming assignments, you don't have to do programming assignment three. It's, it's totally up to you. There will be no, no penalty at all. Okay, I hope I have covered all the questions. If not, please uh, post them on chat. I might, have, I might have missed them. Okay, if not, then uh, let's, let's end it here and I will, and happy Thanksgiving to all of you. We'll, we'll meet next week. All right, bye.